Behind me is London's Charterhouse, a hospital built in the 14th century at the time of the Black Death. Now, everyone assumes that plague is lethal, but in fact, even back then, one in five people survived. By contrast, everyone who developed diabetes died from it. And that situation continued right up until the beginning of the 20th century. But then, 100 years ago, two researchers in Canada changed everything. This is the story of the groundbreaking discovery of insulin. Tilly Tanzi is Professor of the History of Medicine working at Queen Mary University, which stands on the site of the Charterhouse. So Bunting and Best didn't come out of nowhere. They were building on research and knowledge that was already available in the medical world. Uh, but nobody had really sort of put it together or made that great step of doing a key experiment. Banting and Best might have been standing on the shoulders of giants, but neither had any background in research. One was a country surgeon, the other a medical student. Daniel Drucker is a senior scientist at the Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, birthplace of insulin. So Banty was our most unlikely uh, heroes. He thought he had a famous dream that we're all familiar with and he wrote, got up and wrote down on a, a piece of paper that if he could ligate the ducts of the pancreas and isolate the pancreas and purify this mysterious hormone, that might be the key to unlocking the puzzle. Remarkably, he managed to persuade the chair of biochemistry, who was J.J.R. McLeod, a, a famous biochemist. And can you imagine today an orthopedic surgeon from a, a small clinical medical school walking into the big city and asking for resources and money and staff and space to do these kind of experiments? I and mean, today you'd think they would call security and have this person escorted to the curb. Uh, yet McLeod was persuaded, Banty must have been charismatic, gave them lab space assistants like Charlie Best and there they went in the summer of 1921 and the rest is history of course. The very first patient was a young boy called Leonard Thompson who was dying of diabetes in Toronto Children's Hospital and Banting and Best with McLeod and the chemist who had been recruited into the team James Collip uh, had a preparation of insulin that they decided to try to inject into this patient. And it was an absolute failure. Leonard Thompson got this massive abscess in his leg. So, you know, half of his thigh became infected. And if that happened today, the drug regulatory authorities would have put what we call the clinical hold and they would have stopped all treatment. But what happened in 1922 was that, uh, you know, they were allowed to go back to the lab and call up who was the talented biochemist on the team. He worked his magic to purify the extract and the next injection worked and the infection was no longer a problem and off they went. The good news spread fast with patients worldwide wanting treatment. One was Elizabeth Hughes. Elizabeth Hughes was one of the earliest patients of uh, Banting and Best's and she was the daughter of an American diplomat. Um, she was about, I think, 12 when she was first given insulin. She was at death's door. The only treatment for diabetes at that stage was to reduce carbohydrate intake. So she was effectively starving to death, as diabetics did in those days. Uh, she was given insulin. She responded very well to the treatment. And she lived until, I think she was nearly 80. It was reckoned that she'd lived, she'd had about 45,000 injections during her life. For Elizabeth, there was a happy outcome. But back in Toronto, it was the beginning of a PR nightmare. You go from the euphoria of the discovery to the hundreds of letters and telegrams that are arriving daily. And one quickly realizes from Banting to the University of Toronto that's formed a special insulin committee that, oh my goodness, we are going to be in a big, you know, problematic space if we have to tell the world, I'm really sorry, we can only treat 5% of you. 
In 1921, there were very few companies around the world with any kind of industrial capability. Everyone that could jumped onto the bandwagon to try to make insulin. They mainly developed different techniques, different measuring techniques, different standardization techniques. So it's a very confused area. And actually finding the pancreas from which you could develop um, the insulin, and eventually uh, most producers settled on cattle. Some manufacturers claim that it took a thousand cattle to make a dose of insulin. The railroad tracks in Indianapolis were designed to go right into the sort of established abattoir slash laboratory uh, because they had such a huge need that we relied on beef and pork insulin really up until the early 1980s when recombinant DNA technology came to the rescue and we had recombinant human insulin. Production wasn't the only battlefront. Cost and access was an issue from the beginning, as it still is today. Banting had a very clear view. So let's not let profit stand in the way of our ethical obligation to treat the world's population living with type 1 diabetes. One of the companies that um, became very important in insulin manufacture was a Danish company, Novo No Disc. So the University of Toronto sold the insulin patent for a dollar. In Europe, the League of Nations got involved with insistence that companies make minimal profit. Back in Canada, things got ugly when the 1923 Nobel Prize went to just two of the four people involved. Why did they not pick a third individual? So Best was the medical student who won the coin toss to work with Banting that summer, obviously instrumental. But most of us recognize that Colin, the biochemist from Alberta on sabbatical working at the University of Toronto was essential to the purification and development of insulin as a medicine. The discovery of insulin was of enormous significance in the history of diabetes, but how does it compare with other medical discoveries? In many ways, insulin epitomizes medical research in the 20th century. Uh, obviously, the priorities, disputes, and the personalities we all know about, but that is, really came to the fore very much in the 20th century, especially with the lure of the Nobel Prize. It also is a very important in the point of translation of a lab research project into commercial production. And that brings in a whole load of, of issues such as obviously machinery, specialized staff, production facilities, supplies, but also marketing, packaging, preservation, and also for the patient, how you actually get the drug. Insulin revolutionized how patients dealt with uh, disease because patients injected. Injections were really known as something that cocaine addicts used, were not used routinely in medical therapy, and only then as something that a doctor did to a patient. So a patient injecting themselves was really revolutionary, and the patient taking control of their own disease. 